shorts of one Spencer Sankale. It's better to die on your feet than to live on your knees. This evening on the Monday Town Hall Report, we talk about graft and whistleblowers. How do we nurture the culture of whistleblowing in Kenya? This is after one man stood up in the company of three others and blew the lead of 190 million shillings heist at the Mara University. There are several other Spencers in the country, but how much does the law protect them? And how are they inspired to come forth? Hashtag Monday Report at Trevor Mbija, Twaiga Mwaura at Mashirima Kapombe. Use that hashtag and we'll sample some of your views on that very question. How do we nurture the culture of whistleblowing in Kenya? Let me introduce our guest real quick, beginning from my immediate left, Samuel Kimeo. Thank you so much for coming in. Executive Director, Transparency International. Followed by Suzanne Kinyeki. She's a Deputy Director, ESEC, Reports and Data Center. Also, the immediate former Lower Eastern ESEC Regional Manager. Thank you so much for making time this evening. Followed by Steve Ogola, an advocate, also quite instrumental in coming up with the Witness Protection Bill, which still is pending in Parliament. And last but not least, Irungu Hilton, Executive Director, Amnesty International. Also in the front row, I have Rose Mwaura. She's the chairperson, ISPAC. That is the Institute of Satisfied, Certified Public Accountants. She'll be speaking to us about one of their own who blew the lead of 190 million shillings heist. Hashtag Monday Report. Keep your views coming. I'll sample some of them during this broadcast. But I'll start with you, Sam. How do we protect whistleblowers so that we nurture the culture of whistleblowing here in Kenya? Thank you very much, Trevor. I think I would start by saying that we need, first of all, to look into the culture of the way we treat whistleblowers. I think historically as a country, we've been very and kind to whistleblowers and even though it's true that for every case that you see being investigated or going to court there is a whistleblower behind it and often it's a low ranking public official that is vulnerable and would need protection but the history that we have seen in this country is that whistleblowers have been victimized and have died dejected and i think the the, the case of David Munyake is an important one for us to, uh, to, 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 to think about. So we would protect whistleblowers by changing that culture. I think it's a leadership question, but it's also a question of having honest conversations about the fight against corruption and the nature that it takes. And to recognize that behind all these cases are real people who have said enough is enough and I am going to come forward irrespective of the risks that uh, come with it, yeah. to blow the whistle on what is happening in this institution. All right. I think the other bit is the laws. We yeah. need to enact laws that comprehensively protect whistleblowers. We have snippets of laws here and there that uh, provide pro protection of whistleblowers, but they are not adequate. And the bill has been uh, was developed from way back in 2016 by the Attorney General's office in consultation with stakeholders. Um, the last I checked, I understood that it is still in cabinet. I think it's time to urge cabinet to get it out of uh, out of their their, their closets yeah. and take it to parliament so that it can be debated and enacted. Okay, Suzanne, let me bring you in. And how is the EACC encouraging whistleblowing? Okay, um, thank you very much. Good evening, viewers. Now, Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission is a constitutional commission pursuant to Article 79. How we are encouraging whistleblowers? We have put uh, an anonymous reporting system on our website. But I want to say that uh, whistleblowers should not go out there and start uh, chest thumping. Because more often than not, after they have given us information, our information is encrypted right from the beginning to the end. And therefore, we need to encourage them to come forth. But you must know that we're interested in the content, not the person. But when it comes to protection of whistleblowers at the report center, at the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission, we take them through the motions. And we normally ask them, do you want to remain anonymous or you want us to disclose who you are? So it is really a very dicey situation. We end up with whistleblowers who again go out there and start chest thumping. So but ours is to really encourage them to come because some of the very good cases we have had yeah. and we have secured convictions at uh, ESCC is, is actually as a result of whistleblowers. What do you mean chest thumping though? 
Chest thumping is a situation whereby you come to us, you tell us that there is a wrongdoing happening in institution A, B, C, D. Then you go back to the institution and say, you see, wait, I've actually talked to ESCC. It's just a matter of time. It's not a matter of if. The matter is when ESCC will come for, for them. Mm -hmm. So the idea here is that if you're a whistleblower, you shouldn't talk about it out there? Is that what you You saying? shouldn't. Because at ESCC, we emphasize confidentiality. Remember, ESCC is a law enforcement agency. And therefore, we must secure our evidence. If we blow the lead on whistleblower, then that means the evidential material is going to be compromised. Mm. So we must make sure that we have secured the evidence. We will only disclose, if at all, the whistleblower wants to remain a witness. Because some whistleblowers might not necessarily end up being witnesses. You can whistleblow, but due to personal reasons, you end up not becoming a witness. You just give us the information. Because at ESCC, we emphasize what we want is information. But how fast do you act on that information if somebody brings it to you? What happens at ESCC, we receive the information. We take it through the processes. Yeah. We have what we call five Ws. Uh, with, we have an acronym, one husband with five wives. And basically, the why is the why. What happened? What happened? Who did it? Uh, when, when, where was it, and how much. So we normally take the report through that process. Because again, as a law enforcement agency, you do not want to start an investigation which ends up dry. Yeah. You know, so you want to make sure that, that the report that is in our system has been taken through the process. Does this why include why the whistleblower came forth in the first place? Sometimes, but not always. Because you find that when whistleblowers come, some of them are motivated by something else other than patriotism. Some of them, actually, they have been uh, conned out of the deal, for example. Some of them, actually, they just want self-glory. A few of them are really out to help Kenyans. But more often than not, we are not really interested in the motivation. What we are interested in is what is the content of the information. Okay. Yes. So it doesn't matter why you come forth? It doesn't matter why you come, okay. because we are right. interested in the information that okay. you are giving us. Steve, how much of a blowback, how legal impediment would it be for a whistleblower to speak about something, goes to court, and then there's no conviction? Is there a chance that the accused then turns the guns on you and says, you defamed me? How much legal liability does a whistleblower have? I think it's a, the short answer is that uh, a whistleblower is protected from civil and criminal liability because you're acting in good faith and you're you are contributing to deepening accountability. But I think what we need to get into context first and foremost is that whistleblowing, as we understand it, there should be a, a shared and settled understanding that citizens have an active role to play in anchoring transparency, accountability, openness in governance. That this is a shared responsibility that cannot be deferred entirely to public authorities or state officials that are in charge of this institution, let's say the DCI, DPP, ESCC. Once there's a, a shared and settled understanding among the population that you are a co-owner, you know, into your, in your governance uh, structures, then you lay the foundation for whistleblowing. It means you co-own the decisions that public officers make, the decisions that the government make, and you help the government to make decisions that advance transparency and accountability. Yeah. That is the foundational or philosophical justification for whistleblowing. Okay. It's supposed to improve accountability and openness in our system of governance. And so more there should be no instance where now you become the one who's now trying to defend himself after having whistleblown. Come again? There should be no circumstance where now you're the one who's trying to defend yourself after having been a whistleblower. No, a whistleblower acts in good faith. He acts in good faith. He believes that there's a shared and settled understanding, that I've said, of what we consider as our own core commitment as a people. Okay. I think if you look at Article 10 of the Constitution, part of our core commitment, shared values, national values and principles of good governance, is that people should take accountability for their actions and that all of us should, should contribute to deepening that accountability. Okay. And that's why I talk about public participation in governance. Part of the detail of public participation means if you believe something is going wrong, you have a duty to report. And when you report, you report not as a matter of obligation, legal obligation per se, but you report because you have that residual obligation as a citizen or as a resident to contribute yeah. to deepening accountability, transparency in our act and in our technique of governance. What if you were left out of the deal? That's why you came forth. Because then well, at that point you have some liability. 
you watched over corruption happening for a while and then the deal went south and now you want to whistle blow. No, that will be the exception to the rule. The rule is whistleblowers are candidates for protection. Okay. I don't think we can deepen and understand, we can develop an understanding, uh, an argument that exposes whistleblowers to further interrogation. Why did you come out? Okay. I think that, that itself is a question that is not undermines the core reason why whistleblowing, whistleblowers come out. Okay. If you come out, I think the people that are receiving this information, if you like, should be interrogating the issue, as she said, the content. Yeah. Has there been an offense or not? Not really the motive. If that offense has been, has been committed, I think it should be happy okay. as an investigative agency that someone has reported that offense. All right. Now, whether, that's, whether there's, uh, that, that, that reporting has been inspired by some material motive, that's not really, really within the realms of uh, the investigative agency. Okay. In any case, they say, no one can tell the mind of man except the Lord himself. Okay. <laughs> just deal with the issue. All right. <laughs> Irungu, what do you make of it? How do we foster and nurture that culture of whistleblowing amongst Kenyans? So first, I'd just like to um, start by commending the four whistleblowers uh, that are at the center of this Mara Heist Expose, which um, I think took a great deal of courage. And it's, I think, you know, the, particularly if I look at um, the quote that was given yesterday, which was, um, it is better to stand on your feet than to die on your knees which actually is a quote that was spoken once by Deden Kimadi um, 60, 70 years ago. And I think what I would like to start by saying is that these four, these four men represent you know, that line of uh, resistance against impunity, against abuse of office, and against human rights violations. So I'd like to honor them first before I come to your question. Yeah. The second, I think, is just to uh, also commend um, you know, Asha, um, uh, uh, Wahiga, Jamila, and the team at Citizen for breaking the story, because we have seen in the press a greater relux reluctance to actually tell the truth and to expose cases like this um, in the last few years. So this is great journalism. It's good investigation work yeah. and I think we just have to applaud you uh, as a nation today right. what can we be what can we do all the whistleblowers that I've spoken to are really are usually propelled by three things they are propelled by the love of God they're prepared by a sense of patriotism that their country can be better and that this is not what we were put on this earth to do and thirdly they are um, I guess they are guided by their own sense of self-respect that they will not be part of something that takes um, medicine out of the um, arms of, of pa patients or uh, food out of the mouths of children. And this is, I think, a very important uh, distinction. So these three things seem to cut across all of these uh, uh, whistleblowers. But I think what we have to say is that we do not provide an environment for whistleblowing. Now, it's not just Kenya. I mean, historically, there has always been a, um, I guess, a cost that comes with telling the truth, particularly when you are um, essentially exposing power and privilege being used in, a, an, in an abuse of office uh, scenario. So this has been the case, whether, you know, it was, um, if you think about it, uh, you mentioned Munyeke, uh, but I would also ask um, uh, Mrs. Mwatela, uh, who was uh, the Central Bank um, uh, 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 of Kenya staff. Um, John Gidongo, for example, is facing, you know, upwards of a 24 million, um, uh, you know, fine for essentially doing his job. He told the country corruption was happening, and now he is at the uh, mercy of a court um, that essentially says that he has defamed, um, uh, 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 I guess, a suspect in this case. Um, and I think what we have to recognize that actually it, there is great cost in telling the truth and there is great cost in uh, protecting the republic against thieves. Yeah. All right. Let me bring in uh, the chairperson for ISPAC, Rose Moura. And you sent out a statement earlier on saying that you will stand with Spencer and the others who blew the whistle. Is it fair to assess that accountants are the ones who run these rackets of corruption because every transaction goes through an accountant and they are the ones who balance the books. Um, thank you, Trevor. As you've said, my name is Sipia Rose Mora. I'm the chairman of the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Kenya. Um, the first thing I want to say today here is I'd like to acknowledge the courage of uh, CPA Spencer Sankale and his three colleagues um, in terms of coming forward and saying enough is enough, we are going to provide um, this information um, to the public through the media. I think it's important that we acknowledge 
and we saw it, the kind of pressure that accountants face every single day, and not only accountants, but all professionals face every single day in just getting their work done. Um, when you look at, um, we still don't have the full facts, um, so for us at the Institute it's important that um, we get the full facts and we will be um, asking um, CPA Spencer and um, all the other uh, CPAs, especially the other CPA who was also mentioned, um, to come so that we can, to the Institute, so that we can actually get the full um, information of what happened uh, before we can uh, make um, any judgments. As you've heard here, many accountants have actually lost their lives. We know a number of accountants who've lost their lives uh, because of um, whistleblowing. Um, we know others who have been transferred to what they call less desirable positions because they refused to um, approve uh, certain payments. And um, it's important that um, at ISPAC we do not condone misappropriation of um, uh, funds. And in fact, um, our act, Section 30 of our act actually makes it very clear that um, an accountant, the ethical guidelines and the applicable standards that an accountant, um, the accountancy profession asks for, must be followed and must take precedence over any demands from an employer um, or, or a client, um, in so to speak. And so it's very important um, for us, for all accountants to be aware of this. But of course, as we sit here, we also don't understand that the tremendous pressures that um, accountants face in their day-to-day -day jobs. I've met and talked with a lot of accountants who feel that, um, as you've asked me the question, in every fraud, there will be an accountant, but why will there be an accountant? Because money has to be released. And who releases that money? At the very point of release of the money, there'll be an accountant. But what is important here is that this country is not looking at the full cycle. Who's the accounting officer? Remember there's a difference between the accountant and an accounting officer. The accounting officer is the CEO in this case, was that vice chancellor or the DVM or whoever was responsible um, for approving these payments. But we only seem to, we, all, we only always focus on, on the particular accountant. But of course, it's very important. So we, we look at the entire, for example, the Public Finance Management Act, so that every professional and every accounting officer actually takes responsibility for their role in this um, cycle. Okay. Um, I think, let me just also talk about the Whistleblower um, Act. We don't have a national legal framework that's appropriate uh, to defend uh, um, all the whistleblowers. So a lot of accountants are very, very reluctant to come forward because they know that um, there will be no protection for them when they come forward. And as we've said, a lot of them have, have lost their lives. We know that the bill has been pending in parliament yeah. for the last five years. And we, as professionals, I think the best we can do in this country is to really push parliament okay. and the cabinet to make sure that this bill and the necessary protections for all whistleblowers are passed as soon as possible. All right. I'll open the floor to questions. I'll take them in batches of three by a show of hands. You're the closest to me. I'll take these three first. Sir, just mention your name and the question direct. Well, thank you. My name is Julia Sokoth. I'm an independent community organizer. Mine is to Ogola. Maybe you can enlighten me on this. Sorry? To Ogola? Uh, Ogola, yeah. OK. Uh, with this whistleblower bill, uh, me as a community organizer, so many community, com community members always go and report to maybe ESEC, IPOA, or Buddhism, National Police Service, or even uh, Kenya National Commission of Human Rights. How do you synergize this? Uh, how, how did that bill synergize this uh, information that's coming on? Because there's a fear in the community that if I report to ICC, there is no confidentiality. Because I'll be protected with another agency apart from ECC. If that bill gives uh, like somebody like uh, IPOA, power to give protection to, to the whistleblower or ESCC has its own agency, different from different another agency. Thank you. Okay, next question back here. My name is, my name is Kombedo Michael, human rights defender, stock political activist. How are the EAC going to tame this bureaucracy by the time you are launching this case? An instance, a common man have realized that people are inflating contract prices, floating procurement rules, awarding tenders to the work never done, 
and uh, manipulating account, the books of account. As a good right person, maybe you, are, you have realized something is happening in a certain city of office, in an institution like university, or in a public office. So which criteria are you going to put that me as compared to Michael, when I blow this whistle, I'm not going to be harmed. The perpetrators are not going to use his proxies to come for me because they'll be threatening me. They'll tell Mike, if you remember the story of Martin Luther King, the story of Jacob Juma, the story of George, George Gitongo. What, what are some of the legal, legal framework are you going to put in place so that we people, we the whistleblowers in the country, you are going to protect us? Thank you. Okay. Next question. Was it closer to me here? Let's come to you. Yeah. Then I'll come to question. Okay. Mine is very simple. Uh, it goes to Susan. Okay. Uh, my name is Victor War a human rights defender and also an activist mine is very simple so when will this menace call corruption when will we take action as ESCC because when we, when we see the media the DCI arrest people then after that we don't see any action being taken so when will ESCC take this Thing or this man is called corruption very seriously. Okay. All right, Madam Susanna, I'll start with you because you have, we are taking them in batches of threes. Let them answer that. Then I'll take the next three from that other side. Okay. There are two questions to you. One, the bureaucracy. How do you cut the bureaucracy to make sure that people come to you and they give information without any blowbacks? And the other one is how fast can you take action that came from him? Because they've seen instances where people walk in in the revolving doors and walk out the other side. Okay, um, le thank you very much for those questions. Let me start by the procurement irregularities. If, as a citizen, you have any report on procurement irregularities, you can walk into any Huduma centers. We have 50 Huduma centers in Kenya. Other than that, you can walk into any ESCC regional offices. We have 11 regional offices. Now, in the event that you do not probably want to do that, you can log on to our system and you can report anonymously. Now, in terms of uh, reporting corruption, what happens? We have a forum which we call multi-agency multi, uh, multi task force, whereby we together with DCI, DPP, um, KRA, we work together. So that if, for example, like what is in the public domain, this report was taken to uh, DCI. As ESEC, we work for the same government. We are not going to take that case. We believe that DCI is competent because we have a forum which uh, we share uh, together. So when will ESEC take action? It depends on the report that comes to us. For example, if the report that comes to us is scanty, we ask the person to develop more, uh, to give us a bit more information. And let me talk a bit about anonymous reporting, which is on our website. We have seen that members of public do interact with us through anonymous reporting. However, they close what you call a dialogue box meaning that I cannot, as an investigator, get more information. So what I want to encourage members of public, in the event that you want to make yourself anonymous, please leave the dialogue box open so that we can interact. Now, in terms of taking action, I know there has been uh, perception that probably we are taking too much time. Investigation is both a science and an art. And sometimes you don't have enough evidence to sustain a conviction or even to go to trial. And we have other mechanisms whereby you can go for mediation, you can go for uh, reconciliation, or you can actually have a plea bargaining. But that is only if the evidence we have can uh, withstand a trial. Because again, you don't want to take a case to DPP and then it ends up falling flat on the foot. Okay. Because if it falls that, then we are going to be sued for defamation. So as a law enforcement agency, we must make sure that whatever evidence we have is watertight. The other thing, in terms of whistleblowing, is securing our evidence. We must make sure that that evidence is secured. Why? Should we go to trial? As ESEC, we are a law enforcement agency. We do not want to have prosecution in a public court, okay. for example. We want to present that evidence as is because of contamination. There's what you call chain of custody. If, for example, that evidence is contaminated, uh, Wakili here will tell you it is not admissible in a court of law. Yes. Okay. Steve, there was a question around yeah. the bill. Well, I think there, uh, there are two things I want to clarify before I comment on the bill. The idea that without a comprehensive legal framework, then Kenyans are left stranded, that, that is not entirely true. If you look at our existing laws, 
the way the laws are being revised and the way law, parliament is making new laws, every legislation passed by parliament, there is an opportunity there for public participation, public engagement. If you look, if you look at that in its broader context or its connotative context, it means that opportunities exist for reporting to anyone. Now, what Kenyans need to understand is this. You can whistleblow, you can report corruption, fraud, infraction of the law, violation of any right to any public agency or any consumer organ. Then that consumer organ or independent office or even public office, understanding the nature of the complaint, if this not, does not fall within their remit, within their mandate, then they will guide you on where to take it. And I think what has, what has gone unattended, or maybe what has not been noticed in all this, if you look at the expose by uh, Mr. Wego Moura, Spencer came out and he took that report to the DCI. The, you know, over time, there has been some incremental, incre uh, incremental uh, public confidence in what may be attributed to what I would call as collaborative greatness between the DCI and the DPP. They have worked hard to win public confidence to the extent that somebody can feel confident that I can go and report yeah. and that action, action will be taken. Now, this is a strong, this is a, this is a positive input that other commissions, ESCC here, other consumer commissions should take cue okay. and ask themselves how, how do they reach to the public so that the public can feel comfortable to report to them. But yeah. the key highlight is this. Any Kenyan, if you are aggrieved or if you are aware whichever way, of an infraction or violation of the law, corruption or fraud, you can report to anyone, including your pastor. Yeah. Then the pastor will work with you. But the advantage of reporting to formal channels, these are people who have sworn by the Constitution to defend the Constitution. Okay. They have taken the oath of office. They are unlikely to breach the confidentiality. Okay. You know, as, as she said, if the matter is too sensitive and requires further interrogation, if you report it to someone who is not, was, was not given, because you know, in any society, yeah. there are people who may want to use that information, although you may report it in good faith, but they might, they might want to use that information to extract yeah. some benefit from the person whom, who is accused. Okay. So then you are, you are left exposed. So it's better yeah. as a member of the public to report to formal channels. And then if they're not dealing with that, they can escalate okay. to the relevant authority. All right, I'd like to hear from Sam and Irungu very briefly on this issue. Is it an issue of institutional breakdown or is it a lack of legislation? Well, I would say that um, one, we don't have a comprehensive law and yeah. that is important. Um, a comprehensive law lays out parameters, appropriates resources for protection of, uh, of, of whistleblowers yeah. and also creates opportunity for resources and uh, to be put out there to create awareness about the channels of reporting that do exist and the importance of whistleblowing. Yeah. Trevor, if I may just give you some two important points. One is that according to research, um, there are only, only about six out of a hundred people who are victims or witnesses of corruption will report it in this country. And that statistic has not changed for the last 10 years. It's been between six, the highest I have ever seen is 10, 10%, which means that we are not reporting enough. And therefore, we have to ask ourselves, why are people not reporting? And if you ask Kenyans why they are not reporting, they talk about a number of things. One of them is fear of the reprisals. The second one is basically lack of confidence in the agencies that are there to enforce the law. So they'll tell you, but we've reported before and nothing has happened, mm. you see. So I think there is a question of the lack of the law. A comprehensive law is needed. But our institutions need to up their game when it comes to handling complaints. Because when a complainant has come to an institution to report, one, they expect feedback and they need to be sure that the information they have given is being acted upon. Okay. And I have seen where that there are lapses. An institution yeah. receives information, they're actually acting on it, but yeah. the whistleblower doesn't even know that they're acting on it. Okay. And they are left thinking that, you know, this institution just ignored this information. But that information has not been, yeah. uh, has not been relayed properly. Okay. Another point to make is that if you look at some research that was done in 2016, 
uh, the Global uh, Economic Crime Research by PwC, it says that one out of ten uh, uh, economic crimes are, or crimes are actually uh, discovered by accident, you know. And yet, in almost every crime, you have people who are witnesses yeah. and who would be able to report. It basically means that there's a disconnect between the law enforcement agencies yeah. or the confidence that the public has in those law enforcement agencies and the public itself. Okay. So that's the gap we need to bridge. Okay. And if we bridge that gap, we will find that we will have more reports coming forward that will help us prevent loss of public funds. All right. Irungu? Let me speak to the cultural side of this. Yeah. Too many Kenyans think that they are um, migrants, even bystanders, in their own republic. We do not behave like we are landlords, that we are responsible for everything that happens in this republic. We basically think small, and we try and keep our heads down, hoping that the chaos and the wickedness that is out there does not come our way. And I think primarily that is why the economic survey for last year uh, captured as a figure, I think, 5% of the public reported crime last year. Only 5%. So readiness to report, I think, is a, is a cultural muscle that we need to encourage all of us to have. And I think it has to start at a very young age. We tend to tell our children not to be honest, to look the other way when things are going wrong. I think if we can culture, in culture, you know, students in a, in a sense that we begin to build ethical, engaged and empowered citizens, then by the time they are adults, they are able to take charge of the spaces that they operate. And I think that's the cultural problem that we've got. I, th I find it really exciting that Rose Moira um, and ISPAC have responded so quickly to this case. And I don't know if it's because they have uh, the accountants, and uh, one of them actually works in my office who's on your council, uh, Rispo Lik. And she, um, she tells me that actually things are going to change now that there are more women in charge of ISPAC. And I, I, I just want to acknowledge you for the speed at which you move, because you give courage to accountants. If the law society is bold and uh, you know, kind of protective of its, of its lawyers, it gives courage to its lawyers. If the media council gives protection to journalists, they will do investigative work. If human rights organizations are protective of citizens, we will allow people like Beatrice Mina, I just want to acknowledge her also, they will come forward and they will protect this nation's uh, resources. So I think this is what we need to encourage okay. culturally. All right, brilliant. We have to take a quick break here. I see a lot of hands here for questions. I'll come back to you, I promise. We'll start from that line coming this way really fast. But we have to take a quick break here. I can hear you saying ladies will be given priority as well. Use the hashtag Monday Report on Twitter. We'd like to know how do we nurture the culture of whistleblowing. The conversation is happening right here and we'll be back in just a bit.